SQL is the most important technical skill that you need to know as a data analyst. And there's lots of great guides out there that cover the basics of SQL for free, but very few of them actually use healthcare data as an example. So today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna teach you what you need to know about SQL, and I'm gonna give you some simulated patient data to work with so that you can start building a portfolio that will impress recruiters and future employers. Hey everyone, I'm excited to be doing this tutorial with you today. My name is Josh Matlock. I've worked in the healthcare industry since 2015 as a data analyst at several hospitals on the West Coast, including the Providence Health System, and as of this recording, Seattle Children's Hospital. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what I'm gonna be covering in this tutorial today. First, I'll start by giving you a short intro on why SQL is so important in data analytics and why it's used so often. Then I'll show you how to install the SQL tool that you'll be using, and that's Postgres. Postgres is completely free and easy to use, so that's what we're going to be using. And then I'll talk about our healthcare data source that we'll be using, which is called Cynthia. Next, I'll show you how to load that data into a database. And then finally, the most important part, I'll show you how to get started using SQL with some basic commands, and I'll show you what data in a hospital looks like where I'll give you some example problems to work through. Let's get started. Now, as a data analyst, when I am not in meetings working with my team or my business partners, I spend like 70% of my time in SQL. SQL is basically a programming language that allows you to pull data out of databases, prepare that data in whatever way you need using one or many queries, and then you can use the final query to either report useful information to your stakeholders or what I like to do is plug that data into a data viz software like Tableau or Power BI and create graphs and dashboards, basically telling a story with that data and solving business problems more visually. If you've never used SQL before, let me explain how it works. SQL is almost like a much bigger and structured version of Microsoft Excel or a similar spreadsheet program. Many people use Excel every day to store data in tabular formats. They might track their finances, their survey data, or in our case, patient data. There might be multiple different types of data, in which case you might create different tabs for them, like a tab for patient names, demographics, a tab for their allergies and the vaccinations that they received. But there's a limit to how much data Excel can store. In fact, Excel can only store around 1 million rows per spreadsheet. And if you work at a hospital and you're looking at all the medications that were ever given or all the lab values that were ever drawn against the hundreds of thousands of patients or even millions in your database, you're gonna have way more data than that. And what if you have multiple data analysts wanting to work off of the same Excel spreadsheet at the same time for different reports? Or what if you wanted to update the Excel spreadsheet with the newest patients that just trickled into your hospital? It would be a huge pain to have to manually update the Excel spreadsheet in the hundreds of tabs that you would have to maintain. So this is where Excel really starts to struggle and where SQL really starts to shine. SQL stores massive amounts of data in various databases. It allows multiple people to query against the database. And there's a lot of flexibility for data engineers to update databases with new data on an automated basis. It's also a lot easier for data analysts to pull that data and combine one table of data with another table. If you want to work as a data analyst in healthcare, you will be expected to know the basics of pulling data out of databases and doing some basic data prep. So therefore, you need to know SQL. And that's what this tutorial is all about today. So let's dive right in. All right, so before we can actually start playing with the data, First, we need to install Postgres. I'm gonna show you how to do this two ways, first on Windows, then on a Mac operating system. So to do this on Windows, it's super easy. We're just gonna to go to Chrome. I'm gonna type in www.postgresql.org. I'm gonna to go to Download. I'm gonna to navigate to Windows. And then I'm gonna pick the latest version of this and um, I'm going to click on this hyperlink here that says download the installer and I'll just click on this download button here and that's just automatically going to start the download down below. So I'll wait for that to download fully. I'm going to open that file and then we got our 
setup menu. So I'll just click next here. I'll click next. I don't need the stack builder, so I'm just going to deselect that. I'm going to click next, next. Now we're going to set up a password. So I'll just type my password here. Click next. I'm going to use port 5432. And I'll click next here, next, next. So we'll wait for that to install. All right, it looks like it's done installing, so I'm gonna click Finish. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to bring up uh, Postgres by typing pgadmin4. That's gonna bring up our interface where we're going to query against our databases. We're gonna plug data into our databases. We're gonna do all of our work in Postgres. And this is the graphical interface that's going to allow us to do all of that. So I'm going to click on servers. I'm going to type in my password that I created. And at this point, I'm going to switch over to the Mac installation. All right, so now I'm going to show you how to do this on a Mac. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Safari. And I'm going to type in Postgres SQL.org. That's going to take me to this website here. So I will click download and that's going to take me to this screen. I'll click on Mac OS. I'm going to scroll down to postgres.app and these instructions are pretty straightforward. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the download tab up here and I'll click on the latest release and I will wait for that to download. Once that's done downloading, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on downloads and I'm going to click on that file that we just downloaded. I'm going to drag Postgres over to Applications. Let's try that again. Oh, there we go. All right, so once that's done, we're going to go to Finder. I'm going to scroll down to Applications. I'm going to click on my Postgres application. We'll click Open. And then we're going to click this Initialize button. All right, so once that's done, I'm going to go back to the introduction and see what the remaining steps tell me. So it tells me now to go to the command line. So to get to the command line, I'll go back to the finder here, scroll down to applications. I'll go to utilities and I'll bring up the terminal so we can close out of this. And I'm just going to copy all this stuff that I see here. So I copy that. I'm going to right click and just paste, hit enter. Need to type in my password here. So I gotta type it again. All right, so then I'm gonna close out of that. And now what I'm gonna do is I have installed Postgres, but I still need to install a graphical interface that will allow me to interact with the databases and all the stuff that we're gonna create in Postgres. So to do that, I'm going to scroll down till we see this picture of this elephant here. That's pgadmin4. I click on that. It takes me to this site. Then I click download. And I'm going to click on this Mac OS and this most recent version here. And then I'm going to download uh, this file, this .dmg file. So I'll click on that. That's going to download, so that'll take a few minutes. And once that's downloaded, we'll go back to downloads. I'll click on that. We'll agree. And then we're just going to do the same thing again, where we drag this over to applications. Now, once that's done, I'll go back to my finder, scroll down to applications, and I'll look for that PG admin that we just installed. Here it is. So double click. I'll click open again. So let's right click on this and let's register the server. I'll just call this PG. I'll call this PG 15. And then I'll call this local host and then I'll save that. And then that should create our uh, databases. And we'll have this initial one here, Postgres, as well as a um, a database that has my username here. So at this point, I showed you how to do this on both the PC and Mac. And we're now at the point where both steps will be identical on 
either operating system. So I'm going to switch back to the PC and I'm going to do the rest of the tutorial from the PC. All right, so we're back to the PC and we've installed our Postgres SQL. And the next thing we need to do is we need to load data into Postgres. So to do that, I'm going to go back to Google Chrome. I'm going to type GitHub first. So I'm going to go to GitHub. And then I'm going to search for data dash wizardry. Wizardry. And I'm going to look for users here. And so here's what my profile looks like. Josh Matlock data dash wizardry. So I click on that. We go up to repositories and then you're going to select the SQL webinar one. And then there should be this link that says create new tables. That's going to give us some SQL code to start with. That's going to create some tables that are going to contain some of this fake patient data that we're going to build. So I'm just going to click this copy button here, it's copy raw contents. I'm going to go back to Postgres. Now, before I load or before I create these tables, uh, one thing I should tell you is how databases, schemas, and tables work. So imagine that you have a filing cabinet and that filing cabinet is going to have a drawer. Okay, so the drawer is going to represent your databases. So let's say we have a drawer for this database here, Postgres. Um, so that, that drawer is going to have some various things, including schemas. The schema is going to be like your various folders. You can have multiple schemas within a database, and that folder or that schema is going to have various files. So our public folder or schema, for example, is going to have various files like aggregates, collations, domains, FTS configurations. Some of these I never even use. I mostly use views, tables, procedures, and functions. Okay, so these are the files that I use the most. Functions, procedures, tables, views. I won't go into all of those things today. I'm just going to talk about tables. So you can think of tables as various files within your folder, which is your schema. And then those folders exist within a drawer of your filing cabinet, which is your database. So just one analogy to kind of help solidify things. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go up to my public schema. I'm going to right click and I'm going to say query tool. And then I'm just going to paste in the contents that I copied from GitHub. Then I'm just going to click this run button, or I could just click the F5 button. But once I do that, I go to tables and you should, well, actually I'm going to right click on tables first, click refresh, and then click this down arrow. And you can see I now have four tables. They don't contain any data yet though. We only created these empty tables that are going to accommodate data very shortly here. So now that we've done that, I'm just going to hit control A to select everything. I'm going to delete. So now that our tables are created, what we need to do now is we need to fill those empty tables with data. To get to that data, I have a website where I've hosted those files. Once those are finished downloading, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on this table that I just created. And if you don't see these, it might not be fully expanded. It might be collapsed. So you just click on that arrow again and they should show up again here or you might have to refresh and then expand out. But once you do that, you should see these four tables here. So next I'm going to right click on conditions and I'm going to import slash export the data. I'm going to look for the thing that I just downloaded and that's going to be, I'm going to have to click all files here and then we've got conditions here. Now what you need to do here, this is really important to get this to work correctly. So you need to make sure that this is in a text format. Okay, so it needs to be in a text format. Then you need to go to, you, may, you need to make sure that this tab import is selected here. I uh, don't select anything for encoding here. For options, uh, make sure that it looks like this and that OID looks like that. 
make sure that delimiter is just a comma here, and that should be the default option. And then make sure that this thing here, null strings, is backward slash n, just like that. Otherwise, it won't work. Okay, so we're going to select OK, and then that should import. You should see a green box here indicating that that successfully loaded. So if I were to say select star from uh, from public dot conditions, this is my schema, and this is my table name of the data that we just loaded data into, and select star means select every single column from that table. We do that, and we should have data. Let me just close out of those, expand this, and there we go. Here are our conditions. Next, we're going to go to encounters. All right, so let's right click on this like we did before. We're going to go to import export data. So import, we're going to select the encounters file that we just downloaded. So encounters, and again, making sure that every step is the same as before. Text, import button selected here comma delimiter. These options should look like this. And then there should be a backward slash n just like that. Click OK. It might take a moment for that data to load, but there you go. The data is now loaded. I'm going to do this again, right? Select everything just to make sure that it's all working. I click this button to run that. There's all of our encounters. All right, so next going to do the same thing. Import. We're going to go to immunizations. And we're going to make sure we got that backward slash n. That's loaded. And then lastly, right click on patients, import. And we'll go to all files, patients. All right. And there we go. By the way, if you're wondering where this data comes from, don't worry, this is not real patient data. We're not breaking any HIPAA laws here. This is all synthetically generated data, and it comes from a program called Cynthia. Cynthia is an open source educational tool where you can download fake patient data, and it emulates a patient database, a electronic medical record system. So it has a lot more data than what we see here. It doesn't just have conditions, encounters, immunizations, patients, but it also has things like allergies and care plans and the surgeries that the patient received, the lab values. It, it shows you the medications that were given. And the developers did a really good job of modeling all this data to represent a real world scenario or a real hospital. So things like diabetes, for example, you might actually see the same percentage of people suffering from diabetes that exists within the community. The people that developed Cynthia actually modeled all of this stuff against uh, real world patterns that they observe uh, for people suffering from various diseases or how long they tend to stay in the hospital. So there's a lot of statistical rigor that was put into the development of Cynthia. So it should be pretty real looking. And now there's still a lot of things that need to be worked on in Cynthia to make the data look even more real, but it's a really good starting point if you wanna sink your teeth into a data project that looks like a hospital database. Another problem with Cynthia is that it uses a coding paradigm called SNOMED. SNOMED has all these codes that determine what did the patient suffer from while they were in the hospital? What procedures did they have? What was the reason for their encounter or their visit to the hospital? And while SNOMED is free in a lot of different countries, there are some countries where a user of SNOMED might be expected to pay some sort of fee. So if you happen to live in one of those countries, you might not legally be able to actually use Cynthia and display that on a dashboard on Tableau Public. So to err on the side of caution, what I did is I stripped out all of the SNOMED codes and replaced them with things that you can use, like, for example, ICD-9 codes, which are public domain. So long story short, my version of Cynthia is a little bit different in order to avoid any possible legal issues of you 
displaying any of this data that you might develop in a dashboard like Tableau and publishing that to Tableau Public. All right, so let's continue on. So we've loaded all of our data into these tables and I've explained a little bit about how Cynthia works. Now let's actually get started on some select statements. So SQL is basically just a language that allows you to pull data and alter its contents using some very straightforward language. And select is one of the first things you type when you're writing a SQL statement usually. Select is going to select various columns within the table that you're using. So for example, we see all of these things here. We've got ID, birth date, death date, social security number, drivers, passport, prefix, blah, 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 blah. If we wanted to select all of those columns, we would do select star from our table name, and that's patients. I like to preface this with the schema, and that's the public schema. So I type public.patients, that should bring up all of our columns here. But let's say I only needed the patient's name and their birth date. So I, I see that they have the first name, the last name, the maiden name. I'm just going to select their first, last, and their birth date. Okay, birth date. So you do that, you run that, and you get the three columns that we talked about. First name, last name, and birth date. So here's all the patients and their birth dates that we have in the database. And to write that out, you just separate each column with a comma, with the exception of the final column. You do not include a comma here. By the way, you can also have these select and from statements all in lowercase if you wanted to. I actually prefer to write my statements in lowercase when I can, just because I think it's easier to look at, but you know, everyone has their own preference. Another thing that you might see me do every now and then is rather than having the commas on the right, sometimes I put them on the left like this. So, you know, the, this comma is like basically it being over here, for example. And this comma is basically the same as having it like over here. I just put them over here instead sometimes because it's more clean looking that way. If I wanted to create other columns in the future, like let's say I wanted to look at their social security number, their passport, their, their ID number, it's, it's cleaner to have all the commas on this side rather than on this side where they're not aligned. And it makes it easier to edit in the future. So sometimes I will have my commas on the left side instead. And let's just run that. I want to talk a little bit about encounters in our data set, just in case maybe you're not familiar with healthcare data and you want to know what is Josh talking about when he says encounters? Well, I'll show you what that looks like next. Encounters is this healthcare centric word that refers to a visit really when someone goes to a hospital or they go to a clinic. Usually you're going to be looking at either emergency room encounters or some kind of ambulatory encounter or some kind of inpatient encounter. So let me show you what the different options are in Cynthia. I'm going to select distinct encounter class from public.encounters. What that's going to do is it's going to give me all of the distinct entries, all of the unique encounter classes. So you see here how it says ambulatory, ambulatory, ambulatory. Ambulatory is only going to show up once when I do this, and it's going to show up with all of the other encounter classes. So I'll show you what I mean when I run this. So now you just see all of those unique entries here. We have ambulatory, emergency, home, hospice, inpatient, outpatient, skilled nursing facility. And these encounter classes actually look somewhat similar to what I'm used to seeing when I work at a hospital. Uh, with the exception of ambulatory and outpatient, those are pretty much the same thing. So if I were the architect of this database, I would probably just lump ambulatory and outpatient within the same category. But I'll just kind of walk through what each of these things mean. So ambulatory and outpatient, that refers to instances where you go to the hospital and you're done in the same day. 
Maybe you're a dialysis patient and you're just getting a simple dialysis treatment. Usually the patient goes in for a few hours, they get hooked up to the dialysis machine and then they're sent home that same day. Emergency visit is you know, exactly how it sounds. You go to the emergency department and maybe you broke your arm and the doctor just gives you a cast to put the arm in and he mends that broken arm and sends you on your way. Or maybe someone has chest pains. They think they're having a heart attack, but it turns out they're just having really bad acid reflux and they're sent home that same day. Home visits could refer to home health where a medical professional sees you at your residence and treats you on the spot. Hospice care is typically reserved for folks who are in the end stages of their life and don't have much longer to live and are given comfort care measures. Inpatient care is usually for folks who have some serious condition that needs immediate treatment within the hospital. Maybe they're getting a kidney transplant and they just received their new kidney and they just need to stay for several days just to make sure that their body doesn't reject the new kidney. Or maybe someone originally went into the emergency room to address chest pain and it turns out they have a clogged artery so they have to go in for surgery and maybe they have to sit around for a little while to for their heart to recover. Skilled nursing facilities are typically reserved for folks who are maybe physically disabled or maybe they're a little bit older. Urgent care you're probably familiar with but let's say you have a fever and you didn't feel like it was urgent enough to go to the emergency room but you needed some a physician to treat it pretty quickly, maybe you go to an urgent care facility rather than emergency care. A virtual visit is where you have some kind of visit on the computer with your doctor. Maybe it's a wellness visit, which we'll look at next, or maybe it's a uh, consultation with the doctor where you're addressing some kind of new problem. Could be a specialist, could be a general practitioner of medicine. Wellness visits are basically like a check-in with your family doctor or your primary care provider, where you maybe have a physical or maybe you address any medical problems that you might be concerned with in a typical office visit. So now that we talked about encounter classes, now let's actually explore the encounter table. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select star from public.encounters. So let's run that. And now let's say that I only wanted to look at the inpatient encounter class. First, I want you to look at this number here. We've got 455,935 rows or records. And notice what happens when I write this statement out. So this is where the where clause comes into play. So right now I'm selecting all of my columns from encounters. Now I'm gonna say where, and I'm going to say where encounter class equals inpatient, where encounter class equals inpatient. Once I do that, I now have only 3,709 rows. What the where clause does is it's basically saying, take some column or multiple columns and according to whatever condition I have here, in this case, I'm saying where the encounter class equals inpatient, only give me the rows where that column is inpatient. So where is basically reducing the number of rows in your data set based off of some rules that you're dictating on one or multiple columns. So I could do other things here too. I could say, for example, that I only want the inpatient encounter class as well as ICU admission. So if I said where encounter class equals inpatient and description equals ICU admission. So this was at 3,709 3, rows. Now once I run this again, so now I'm at 162 rows because I said, well, not only do I want the encounter class to be inpatient, but I also want you to also return the rows where they are also ICU admission for the description. So now we've got two rules that will reduce my row count even further. Let's say that I wanted to add another condition where I wanted to look at the 
dates. I only want rows that take place in the year 2023. So we've got our start date here and we've got our stop date here. So if I want to restrict this to the year 2023, I need to pick if I want to do this on the start date of that encounter or the stop date of that encounter. By the way, the stop date of the encounter is commonly referred to as the discharge if you're dealing with inpatient cases like we are in this example. So I might say where encounter class equals inpatient and description is equal to ICU admission and the stop date is greater than or equal to 2023-01-01. And because this has this extra like timestamp here, like the actual like military time, I'm going to type out 00 colon 00. So we run that. Now we should only have inpatient ICU admissions where the stop time or the discharge date occurred within 2023. Now let's say it's a year later, like right now as of this recording, it is the year 2023. But let's say we wanted to keep this query around and we wanted to run this in the year 2024, but we still wanted to limit this data to 2023. I might add another and requirement. And I might say, and stop is less than or equal to 2023-01. Or actually, no, that would be December that we would need. So December 31, 23 colon 59. So then this shouldn't change the number of rows in our data set, but it will keep this at a consistent number once we reach the year 2024. So just something to keep in mind. Um, you, you can also write between for the stop date. So if I said stop between a date and another date, so this would be 2021, actually, sorry, 2023, 010100 colon 00, 2023, 01, ah, I keep doing that, sorry, December 31st, and then 2359. So that should work just as well. Yep, we have the same results here. So you can get very complex with your where clauses. You could have dozens of different requirements in your where clause if you wanted to. Basically, you're just saying, I'm going to filter this based off of various columns so that I can reduce my row count in some way and just trim it down to just the data that I'm interested in. Now, so far, I've only been using and. All right, let's mix this up a little bit. Let's do something different. What if I just wanted to look at ambulatory and outpatient cases? Recall that when I was describing all of these encounter classes, I mentioned that ambulatory and outpatient are basically the same. What if I wanted to include either the ambulatory or the outpatient? So I'll show you how to do that next. I would just erase all of this and say where encounter class equals outpatient or encounter class equals ambulatory. So I do that. I run this. And when I run this query, notice that there is not only outpatient encounter classes, but there's also ambulatory if I scroll up a little further. Now you might be asking, why didn't I say where encounter class equals outpatient and encounter class equals ambulatory. Let me show you what happens when I do that. I get nothing. The reason for that is because, and I'm just going to switch that back to or, a column can't be two things at once. It can't be outpatient and ambulatory. It can only be one thing at a time. So if you said where encounter class equals outpatient and it's ambulatory, it's not two things at once it can only return that one thing that it listed out. So in this case, I would say 
return the rows that are either outpatient or it's ambulatory. Another way that I could write this out and get the exact same result is if I said we're in counter class in outpatient and ambulatory. So I will enclose this with parentheses. Notice that my row count is 329,997. And once I do that, I should get the exact same results here. I actually prefer to use the in statement when I'm referring to a column with multiple entries that I'm interested in because it's, it's less lines of code. It looks a little bit cleaner. So whenever I have a situation where I'm looking at some column, like just one column, and I'm just looking at one thing or another thing within that column, I almost always use the in statement just because it's more concise. Now that we've talked a little bit about encounters and explored the where clauses, I'm going to dive into a new table called conditions. So let's start a new line of code here. And I'm going to say select star from public dot conditions. So with conditions, what we have here is we have a start date, we have a stop date, patient encounter code and description. So the start and stop dates are going to denote the length of time where there was some problem for the patient, some sort of diagnosis code. When a patient comes into a hospital, they are going to be diagnosed with something. If you have a sore throat, you might be diagnosed with sore throat. If your appendix is about to burst, you might be diagnosed with appendicitis. If you have a moment of anxiety uh, or depression, that, that will be diagnosed on your chart. You have all this stuff that's saying when you were diagnosed with some particular condition. And the code here, I'm using an ICD-9 code here to denote that. And here's the description of that code. So 277.7 .7 is the ICD-9 code for dysmetabolic syndrome X, or 285.9 is the ICD-9 code for anemia unspecified. And then this particular patient here had that condition from this date. And then if it's blank, what that means is that we don't know if there's actually an end date for that patient yet. But if it does have an end date, then some provider or physician or nurse said, all right, this psychological distress in this example started in 1953 and ended in 1957. So we have, when did this thing start? And if we know when it stopped, when did it stop? If it says null, then we don't know whether or not it stopped because it hasn't been documented yet. So now what I wanna do is I wanna to talk to you about the group by statement. Let's say that a doctor comes to me and they say, I want to know all of the descriptions that ever happened and how many patients we have or how many occurrences of this thing did we have in our patient population for all of these descriptions. They just want to know the number of times that these conditions happened within their patient population and they want that number in descending order. So the most popular things happening at the top and the most rarest things happening at the bottom. That would really lend itself well to a group by statement. So let me show you what I mean by that. If I were to start writing this, so I would need to first say description, followed by count. This is going to give me the number of occurrences of this description. And I'm going to write from public.conditions group by. So this is where the aggregation starts to take place. I'm specifying that I only want to look at these unique entries and I want to count off how many times these happen. So this will make more sense in a moment. So group by description. And that's I think that's all we need to do for this statement. So I do that. Notice what happens. Now we only see these conditions showing up once, but there's something right next to it that says count. And I could actually call this whatever I want. So I'll call this as count of condition. So once I do that, that count is now count of condition. 
So you can see we have all of the occurrences of acute bronchitis now. We have all of the occurrences of acute cholecystitis. We have all of the occurrences of acute myeloid leukemia without mention of having achieved remission. Some of these are pretty rare though, and we don't necessarily want the rare things to show up with the more frequent things. So another thing you can do to organize this data a little bit better is by adding something called the order by statement. So order by count. So we're going to do order by count. And notice that this shows the rarest stuff first, the things that only show up like once. And that's because this automatically sorts things in ascending order. We want to sort this in descending order. So I'm going to type DESC. If I wanted to do it in ascending order like it's doing now, I would just type ASC, but that's the default. And I want descending, so I'll type DESC. All right, I'll run that. And now we see, we see all of the most common things that show up for the patient. So other psychological or physical stress not elsewhere classified is the most common condition, followed by pregnancy, followed by acute bronchitis. The list goes on. There's so many conditions here, but this is how you would do this if you wanted to just specifically look at the description and list out the number of times that that description happened within your data set. You would use group by. Now let's say that the person requesting this data, let's say that they only wanted to look at descriptions where you have 2000 instances of this thing or more. So in other words, we don't care about unspecified otitis media or streptococcal sore throat or any of those things below because they have less than 2000 occurrences of that condition. So what we would do is we would use the having statement. So the having statement actually occurs before order by. We're going to type having count and we're going to say greater than 2000. So this functions a lot like the where clause, except it's only used when you're aggregating data using the group by statement. I'll show you what that looks like. So now we have a much smaller list and we're only returning the conditions that have at least 2000 instances of this thing occurring. Uh, and you know, you could go even further. You could say 5,000 if you wanted to and make it even smaller. So having clause works somewhat like the where clause, except it functions only on these group by statements where you're doing aggregations. So that's the only scenario where having is going to be used. And so you're saying, well, I want to use this count as my filter. So you would say having count, and then you'd plug in your number right here. Now you might be asking, so we're using the having clause here, having count greater than 5,000. Could I use the where clause at the same time that I use the having clause? And the answer is yes, you can do that. So let's say that I'm done running my query and the doctor or business partner looks at this and they say, hey, this looks great, except I don't really care about body mass index. That's something that's not really a disease. That's just kind of like a situation that they have. I don't care about that. Let's get rid of that. So this is a great example where we don't necessarily need to use the having clause here to trim this down even further. What I would do in this situation is I would just say where the column description does not contain this thing. So I'll show you what that looks like. So I'm going to say where, where description is not like this thing or does not equal this thing is what I should say. So that exclamation mark and that equal sign means this does not equal this thing. So I'm going to uh, control C to copy this right here. I'm going to do control V to paste it. And I'm going to remove this number here. I'm going to remove this double quote and replace that with a single quote. It looks like it created some extra quotes for me that I don't need. So I'll get rid of that. So it should look like this body mass index with this range. And then these single quotes, these apostrophes here. So now it's going to say, all right, give me 
all of the stuff in the conditions table where the count of that thing was greater than 5,000. And you also wanna kick out anything that says body mass index of 30 to 30.9 adult. So we run that and it gets removed. So yes, you can combine the where clause with the having clause when you're using these aggregations, these group by statements. So what I'd like to do now is test your knowledge of what you've been learning so far and see if you can apply what you've learned. So I'm gonna give you a few problems to work through in SQL. What I want you to do is try and write out the code yourself, see if you can solve it. So you'll pause the video as soon as I give you the question. You'll see if you can answer it. Just try taking a stab at it for 10, 15 minutes, however long you need, and then resume the video, and then I'll kind of work through how I solved the problem. So what I want you to do is just write a query that selects all of the patients from Boston. Pause that, try it for several minutes, try writing out a query and see if you can come up with the answer. And then I'll go over that once you resume the video. All right, so now I'm going to go over my answer. So in order to get all the patients from the city of Boston, um, you know, let's just start by looking at what we have in our data set. We've got all these columns here. You'll notice that there is a city column here. Okay, we've got all these cities and all you gotta do is just write a where clause. So select star from public.patients, that's our table, where the city is equivalent to Boston. So we are basically telling the query that we want to trim down our rows to only the city of Boston. So once we do that, we should have 1,016 rows. So that might've been a little too easy. I'll see if I can give you something that's a little bit more complicated. Now for our second question, I'm gonna try and make this a little bit more complicated. Let's say that we have a doctor who's interested in every single time that someone was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. Let's say that the doctor says he already knows the ICD-9 codes that he wants to give you, and they are 585.1, 585.2, 585.3, and 585.4. How would you write a query that returns all of the occurrences of there being some condition with one of those ICD-9 codes? So remember, we are interested in all of them, okay? So take a few minutes to see if you can work through the problem and then uh, resume the video when you wanna see the answer. All right, so what I would do in this scenario is I would write select star from conditions. Okay, so we have all of our conditions here and recall that you can use this where something is in something else. So this column code is in 585.1, 585.2, 585.3, 585.4. So we're basically saying this code has to contain one of these codes. So it's either this thing or it's this thing or it's this thing or it's that thing. And once we do that, once we run that, we get all of these occurrences of some diagnosis being made where the patient had chronic kidney disease and that's stage one through stage four. Okay, so that would be the way that you would approach this question. You should have 3,869 rows here. I'm gonna give you one more practice problem before we move on and I'm gonna make this harder. So I've actually prepared it right here. So I have this comment that says, write a query that does the following. One, it lists out the number of patients per city in descending order, and that city does not include Boston, and you must have at least 100 patients from that city. Now, when you're doing this, just keep in mind that that patient's table, and I think I mentioned this earlier, but that patient's table only lists out each patient once, okay? So see if you can figure out how to write a statement, a query, that does all of this stuff. So again, I'll give you a few minutes and then resume the video when you want me to go over the answer. All right, so here's how I would do this. 
So we've got this patience table. So first let's bring up the patience table again, public dot patience. So I'm going to run this and notice that there is a city column in that table. What we want to do is we want to group on the city and we want to pull up the number of patients coming from each city by using count. So I'm just kind of going to kind of repeat this answer here. I'm going to just kind of gradually go through this. So select star from public dot patients. And actually we need to replace this star with city and count to kind of set the stage for this group by city. And I'll show you how that looks so far. We run that and we have all this stuff in here. Uh, but right now it's including Boston somewhere. There, there's just so many cities here, so I'm not going to like look for it. But we don't want Boston in this data set here. So once I exclude it, this should drop to 407. So I'm going to say where city is not equal to Boston. Now, if you haven't notice this already keep in mind that when i'm writing these statements this is case sensitive all of these cities are capitalized at their first letter so we do want to make sure that that first letter is capitalized so i run this now this drops to 407. all right so this drops to 407 because we kicked out boston but we're not done yet we still need to make this in descending order as well so Remember that we have the order by, and then we're going to say count, and we're going to make that descending. So we do that. That's going to look better. But we're still not done yet, because if we scroll to the bottom, we still have like all these cases here where there's just one, one patient coming from some of these cities. And the prompt said that we need to include at least 100 patients from each city. So after the group by and before the order by we have the having count greater than or equal to 100. All right so we run that and we should have 16 rows as our final answer with Wor Worcester at the top and Revere at the bottom. By the way, you might be wondering, what's up with this section here? Like, why is this a different color than the rest of the sections? And shouldn't that be causing some error in the code? Well, no, because this is commented out code. So when it looks like this, when it's kind of like this brown color, that's just basically saying this part is not going to be read by SQL. This can come in handy when you're trying to write a SQL script that clearly labels out everything that you're doing. And it's a good habit to describe as you're going through your code what each thing is doing. So for instance, I might label out this section here to say, and I need to include two hyphens as I'm writing this, at least two hyphens. And I say, this query gives me the count of all patients from their city of residence and there must have been at least 100 patients cities do not include boston okay you could also do the same thing if you let's like erase all of this here and then let's do forward slash asterisk and then backward slash asterisk or sorry um asterisk uh forward slash. Okay, so notice that it still has that same color when we do that. This is just another way of commenting out your code. Now we only have a few minutes left before we end our webinar, so I'm going to wrap things up by talking about this final table called immunizations, and I'm going to give you a high-level overview of the next steps in your SQL learning, which would be joins. So I'm going to select everything from this immunizations table to show you what we're dealing with here. So we've got all of those patient identification numbers. That's going to identify the patients in the patient table. 
So these two IDs, for example, these are this, this is the same patient who received these two immunizations on 2011, July 27th, they got the herpes vaccine and the seasonal flu vaccine. Now you might be looking at this and you might say, you know, it's, I see this ID, but that tells me nothing about the patient. So what this identification number allows you to do is it allows you to do a join. A join is a way to pull in other columns from other tables. So you could make this table wider by including other columns from other tables. And in this case, we're thinking about pulling in maybe the first name or the last name or the birth date of the patient or all three included with all this data here that we're currently looking at. So that patient identification number would be translated into the three things we want to look at. First name, last name, birth date. To pull in those three extra columns, we would have to do either a left join or inner join. There's several different join types and the most common of them are left join, inner join, full outer join, and right join. I only use left join and inner join for the most part, and I could spend another whole hour talking about joins because this is a very complex topic and you, they can get very detailed. I'll show you what it looks like here. So if we scroll down, here is an example. So I run this and now I've got first and last name coming from the patient table and that's lined up perfectly with our immunizations data. So this data I have highlighted here comes from the immunizations table. This data right here comes from the patient's table. We're combining two tables together using the join. And I actually forgot birth date here. So let me add that really quick. So we've got the birth date now. So there should be birth date over here. And there's several pieces to this that you have to keep in mind when you're setting this up. You have to have a starting table, in which case we're picking immunizations. We have to figure out what our joining table is going to be. We already know that that's patients. We need to determine the join type, and I won't go into those in detail today, but we've got these four different types of join. I choose to do a left join in this particular example. You need to specify the thing that you're going to join on, and that's where this part comes into play. Left join public patients on t1.patient equals t2.id. These two columns are basically the same thing. In the table immunizations, the patient identification number is called patient. So that column is called patient. And then in the patients table, that same thing is called ID. So I'm just basically joining on the same type of column. They're just called different things in those two tables. So this on statement is basically saying, look up all these identification numbers on this patient column in immunizations and match that on the patient's table in that ID column. So that ID column is also going to have these same codes. It's going to match those two things together and it's going to pull each of those rows to line them up where those identification numbers meet. So by doing that, by forming that connection, that enables you to pull in these columns. But there's other nuances that you have to keep in mind when you're doing this. If you do a join poorly or if you don't plan it properly, you can end up getting more rows than you started with. And if you use an inner join, usually that will reduce the number of rows. So when you're doing a join, there are circumstances in which you might end up with more rows than you started with or fewer rows than you started with. So you do have to keep that in mind when you're building out these queries. And to understand why that happens, you need to study relationship cardinality. So that goes into one to one, one to many, many to one, many to many relationships. There's so much to talk about that is just too much for today's webinar. But this should get you started with just 
dipping a toe in the water with SQL. Well, we've covered a lot in this past hour, and there's still a lot to talk about when it comes to SQL. Like I said, we need to talk about joins and the relationship cardinalities. We need to talk about functions too. Functions play a vital role in SQL and understanding how everything ties together. We haven't talked about common table expressions and how to divide multiple queries and bring them together at the end. So I'll cover things like that in future videos. If I have piqued your interest a little bit about how to become a data analyst in healthcare, I have a whole video for that. Check this one out. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in another video.